The key to Dennis Henshaw's new research is that he's discovered a mechanism by which our exposure to alpha radiation and our chances of getting cancer are increased by electromagnetic fields. We know that both the magnetic field and the electric field exert powerful forces. For instance, this magnet will attract certain metals, but it has no effect on this column of water. But on the other hand, the electric field, and I can put a static electric field on this spoon from my kitchen by rubbing it on my pull over here, has no effect on metal, but it exerts a very powerful force on this column of water. And it also registers on this instrument. A close look at any television set shows how static electricity exerts a force which attracts particles in the air, like dust. It was Einstein who explained this principle back in 1904. What's less well known is that alternating currents, the kind of electricity you get under power lines and in the home, exerts similar forces. Small particles in the air will be agitated and will move towards the wire. Now that's old standard stuff. The key is to put that knowledge together with our understanding of alpha radiation from radon and its decay products to understand the potential link with cancer. Researchers tested Professor Henshaw's theory that alternating currents from electrical appliances attract radon and its radioactive decay products. When Tastrak was put directly onto a wire with the electricity turned on and then processed in the laboratory, it showed clear traces of alpha particles. And the charged particles in the air from radon decay products will actually be attracted towards the wire. At Portway School near Bristol, students have been able to reproduce what Dennis Henshaw found. Even the electrical appliances we use in the home attract and concentrate radioactive particles. The research is in the early stages, but it has caused excitement among scientists investigating cancer. Conceptually, I think it's fair to say that this is a, a breakthrough. It um, defines a whole new area of investigation which hasn't been explored before, and he, the uh, proposals that he, he's put forward are, are very testable. I think the experimental evidence that Professor Henshaw presents, which is essentially physical evidence, uh, shows clearly that there is a, a, a redistribution of the radon due to the electromagnetic fields. And I think that is that I don't see much room for anyone disputing that. It's, it's clear evidence. I'm sure it will be repeatable in other laboratories. And it's obeying what appear to be sensible physical laws. But the views of Britain's leading cancer experts aren't shared by scientists across the road from the Medical Research Council at the NRPB. We do think, looking at the paper that uh, we have seen of Dr. Henshaw's, that the mechanisms he talks about are more likely to increase the way that radon and its decay products deposit on the table, on clothing, on walls. And I, we can't see an argument for increasing the doses from inhaled radon in the evidence he presents in his paper. Professor Henshaw didn't set out to measure doses of radioactive particles to the lungs, but he's in no doubt some will be inhaled. It's clear in the paper to those who read it that there is increased alpha activity in the air, in the air, around the source of the EM fields. Therefore, the possibilities of increased dose are too numerous to ignore. These are experimental observations, they're not theory. And they're entirely consistent with findings in the aerosol field. With the mechanism in place, what now has to be established is whether it'll increase the dose of alpha radiation to those living in high electric fields, and by how much. And Henschel's paper opens up further avenues for research. Might EMFs lead to other types of cancer? What are the real risks from pylons and electricity in the home? Simon Studholm died four years ago of leukemia. Even with new research pointing to a causal link, it may be hard convincing a court that his or any child's death is the result of electromagnetic fields. But Simon's father is determined to try. 
He's suing the local electricity company, Norweb, and after three years of battling, his lawyer has managed to get him legal aid. And also that, with this being uh, Simon's bedroom here. Simon slept in the room nearest the substation. His father thinks this and the electricity meters on the wall behind his bed were to blame for his illness. EMF readings in the bedroom are still high. After Simon died, when I found out about these, uh, these measurements of his bed head, I th straight away I thought, you know, why didn't I know about these fields? You know, this electromagnetic, this electromagnetic radiation. I should have known about it. My son should not have slept here for 21 months with this, all this going through his body. Um, it's just not natural. Norweb has issued this press statement. There is no evidence of a causative relationship between exposure to EMFs from power distribution lines or domestic electrical installations and adverse health effects, and Norweb will be defending the case vigorously. The big weakness in the case has always been that the scientists, the experts, have not been able to find what the mechanism actually is, or how the electromagnetic fields, in terms of the, uh, the minutiae of the science, might be damaging the cells to create the cancer. What Henshaw is producing is a study that seems in some ways to actually breach that gap, and that uh, if the other scientists around us support what he says, then I think we've got a real uh, strong position in terms of presenting our case to court. Substations and power lines aren't the only source of electromagnetic fields. Overhead electric cables power the main Scotland to London railway line, which runs behind houses in Northampton. Alongside the gardens, there used to be a busy siding, trains shunted in and out all day long. In the same houses, there's been a surprising number of leukaemia cases. Steve and Doreen Williams lost their son Stuart six years ago. Amy Croft, the first child diagnosed, lived at uh, 124, which is at this end of Pembroke Road. Then there was my son Stuart. We lived at number 10 Pembroke Road. He was diagnosed in 1989 and sadly died in 1990 after 11 months treatment. And then there's Matthew G at, 120, at 94 Pembroke Road. Um, we were concerned with Stuart being the second case in the street, but when Matthew was diagnosed in 1992, we thought, this is, no, this is not a coincidence. Three, three children in probably 250 yards, this can't be a coincidence. And the only obvious thing for us to look at was the railway. My daughter was the first child to be diagnosed with leukaemia in the street. Amy was conceived and carried in the house at Pembroke Road and slept in the back bedroom that overlooks the railway line. EMF readings in the back bedrooms and gardens of Pembroke Road are high. As well as this, Northampton is known to be an area high in radon. But the land here suffers from industrial pollution and that's another factor that has to be taken into account when looking at the number of leukaemia cases. Matthew G, the latest child in the street to be diagnosed. 